Hey, good morning, Roots family. Pastor Rich here. I'm always excited and just blessed to be able to share with you from God's Word. If you could turn with me in, uh, to Hebrews chapter 7 as we continue our study through the book of Hebrews. And we'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 10. Uh, before we actually uh, jump into our text, I wanted to actually read a, a verse later on in this chapter um, that I think is just a key to understanding what this chapter is all about. And this is what it says about Jesus and relationship to being this, this high priest. It says this of him. It says that he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And, and, and this chapter is building up to that one particular verse because the fact of the matter is that Jesus right now lives as our high priest and he intercedes for us. And it tells us he's able to save us to the uttermost, right? Save us from all that we need saving from. So I wanted to just throw that verse out there and have you just consider it because the entire chapter is culminating in that verse and telling us that he's alive, he's active right now. He's, he's praying for us. And that's such a comforting reality to know that Jesus' active, active ministry currently is to be interceding for us. So with that in mind, if you remember that after the writer in Hebrews was encouraging these struggling believers um, that God had not forgotten them, right? We looked at this last week. He told them, listen, I know you're struggling, but remember, God has not forgotten you. He reminded them that God is faithful. And then he also reminded them that it would be Jesus who would lead them into glory. God was so gracious that not only did he make a promise which would have been enough that God is a God of his word, right? He's not man that he could lie. Uh, he, he doesn't change. He's immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But God not only made a promise, he also swore an oath to give us reassurance. And then he also taught us last week that Jesus would be the one to lead us into glory. And because of this, we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. And as we begin here in chapter 7, what the writer of Hebrews is going to be doing is he's going to go back to a subject matter that he began to speak about back in chapter 5, if you remember with me. He, he told us in chapter 5 that Jesus had been designated by God to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But remember, he stopped. And, and there's this huge parenthetical statement. He digressed from his subject matter because the readers of this epistle had become sluggish, right? They, they, they didn't mix the promises of God with faith. He told them, listen, by now you should be teaching these things, but I have to almost go back to the elementary elements of the faith and, and kind of start over with you. And listen, there are times when we are being challenged as believers, when we're being exhorted or corrected. And, and, and I know for myself, there are times in my life when I've been on the receiving end of those things, and almost immediately my first thought goes to, why is this person being legalistic with me? Right? If you think about the right of Hebrews, if anything, he's encouraging them to not be bound again under a system of legalism, but to press in in the freedom and the grace that they have in Jesus Christ. And listen, legalism is anything that's attempting to get you to trust in something in addition to Jesus. So if you have loving brothers and sisters in Christ who are exhorting you and correcting you, who are challenging you, don't pull out the legalism card, okay? But actually receive it, as we mentioned last week, as loving correction and grow by it. Because I think, and I know for myself, I think we all would agree that we could all be a bit more teachable. And, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is communicating to these believers. You know, I was thinking about this, uh, with, I was talking to my wife uh, yesterday about this, how when I got saved at 14, the resources that we have at our fingertips now just weren't available. The technology wasn't even available to be able to just have a cell phone that had a blue letter Bible app or to, I didn't even have the, I didn't even know what the internet was when I was 14, Okay. And, and I think about when I first got saved, there was just something about opening up the Word of God, having a journal, praying, writing down thoughts and questions, and then putting on the radio and hearing like a Chuck Smith on the radio. There, there, was, there was something about it that there, there was an effort. There, there was work involved, right? And I think about how Paul exhorted Timothy. He told them, 
that you need to work through the scriptures to in order to rightly divide them. Now, listen, technology is great, right? Technology, in essence, should make things more easy and more accessible and more efficient. But I think sometimes the downside to technology is we can be overly reliant upon it. And, and we're not as diligent as we could be. See, in doing the work of studying God's word, what happens is our hearts are awakened to the beauty and the majesty of who Jesus is. I think about the fact that we've entered into the Advent season, right? This, this, this first appearing of Jesus where we, we see him born in a manger and then the unveiling of God in flesh living amongst us. But as we grow in understanding how majestic he is, and as we grow in our love for him, and as we grow in our commitment to follow him, what happens is we serve him with gladness. And then what we do is we, we actually worship him. See, because what we're going to cover in the first 10 verses of this chapter, it, it's going to be work. Okay, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go into Genesis. We're going to go into Psalm 110. But but. I've learned throughout my life that as we mine through the word of God, as we work through the God, word of God, the reward of what we learn about Jesus is well worth it. And again, I'm going to tell you this. It's not until you work your way through the entire chapter, chapter seven, that you're going to have an appreciation for what we're studying right now. OK. It's kind of like math. I remember a math teacher telling me, well, Rich, you got to learn this because math is foundational. Right. If you learn these principles, math builds upon math. Right. And I was having a tough time with that. Never mind, you know, calculus and and all these other things and advanced forms of math. But I want to encourage you that this is going to be work. But it's a good thing to work through the scriptures. It's a good thing to dive into them. It's a good thing to have questions. It's a good thing to write these things down. It's good that if you listen to the sermon online or you, draw, you draw, join us in person on Sunday, that you're actually left with saying to yourself, man, I need to, leave, I need to dig deeper into these things. And now kind of coming back to this subject matter, if you remember with me, this whole idea of Jesus being a high priest here in the book of Hebrews was first mentioned to us in chapter 2, verse 17, where the writer of Hebrews says, that he's a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. Right. There was that 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 initial hinting that that Jesus was a high priest. And, and it was important for him to develop the idea of Jesus being a high priest and explain it. And then as we delve into it, we learned as we closed last week, chapter six, that he was a high priest, according to the order of this man named Melchizedek. Right. Now, in order to understand that Jesus' high priestly ministry was greater than Aaron's, we kind of have to do this legwork, right? If you remember, the theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus over everything. We, we saw in the beginning of the book that God's declaration and final word to mankind has come through Jesus Christ. Then we saw that Jesus is over the angels. And then we saw that he was over Moses and the Mosaic law. As we kind of ventured into chapter five, we began to see that he was greater than the Aaronic priesthood. And, th and this will be a theme that continues, I believe, all the way through chapter 10. Right now, it would have been easy for the recipients of this epistle who were Jewish believers. Right. It would have been easy for them to be confused, to need further clarification, because as they read the Old Testament, they understood and were taught, according to the Old Testament scriptures, that the high priests of Israel were from the tribe of Levi. All right. Well, let me correct that. The priests of Israel were from the tribe of Levi. And then the high priest had to actually be from the family and the lineage of who? Of Aaron. So they're learning about Jesus. They, they understand and they've come to believe that he's the Messiah. But I'm sure they probably said to themselves, well, how could Jesus be a high priest if he was from the tribe of Judah, right? Naturally, that would have been a question that resounded in their hearts and minds. And I think if we consider that truth and reality, it'll help us patiently plow through these texts and here in Hebrews that can, some, can be a little bit confusing and even a little bit difficult. And the writer of Hebrews is going to give insight into the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He does this by discussing this figure in scripture named Melchizedek. And what he does is, 
He highlights truths about Melchizedek's life in order to apply them to Jesus later on. For what purpose? To show that the high priestly ministry of Jesus is greater than or superior to Aaron's. Now, despite being one of the least mentioned and probably one of the most obscure figures in the Old Testament, this king priest of Salem, Melchizedek, He's really foundational for our understanding of how Jesus could occupy the office of high priest and king. And, and this, this Melchizedek, he plays an important role in the redemptive history, despite how few times he's mentioned in Scripture. Now, before we delve in, I want to kind of preface everything I'm saying by this. In Scripture, and in, study, in the study of Scripture, we have what's known as, as biblical typologies, right? And really what, what this simply means is, these are, this is a method of interpreting whereby an element or, or a person in the Old Testament is seen as a prefigure to one found in the New Testament. Real quickly, if you look in Genesis chapter 6 and 7, you have the account of the flood during Noah's day, okay? So that's an actual historical account but there's something about Noah's flood that was a typology for something used in the New Testament. If you read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Peter says that Noah's flood was a type of, of baptism. Now, I'm going to give you homework. If you want to know how it was a type of baptism, I want you to read the Genesis account and jump into 1 Peter chapter 3 and do some homework. When it is said that someone or something is a foreshadowing or a type of Jesus Christ, what is meant is that this person or, or there's elements that correspond to Jesus' character or actions in the New Testament. Here's an example of that. We know the Passover was implemented in Exodus chapter 12, right? Then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 that Jesus is our Passover lamb who is crucified. Again, that's homework for you. Read Exodus chapter 12 and then and jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and see how these things were pointing forward. Although they were actual historical accounts, they were pointing forward to someone else. So with this in mind, let's look here in verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews chapter 7. It says this. It says, again, at the end of chapter 6, again, we have this hope that God's promises are sure that he's reliable, that he's faithful, that, that Jesus will lead us into glory. And he tells us at the end of chapter 6 and verse 20 that Jesus was our forerunner, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then verse 1 of chapter 3 it says this. I'm sorry, verse 1 of chapter 7 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, made Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned the tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And he is also king of Salem, that is the king of peace. He's without mother, he's without father or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor ending of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues forever. Now, if you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14, I'm going to read quickly the account that the writer of Hebrews is referencing, right? In these verses, we see Melchizedek appear upon the scene and, and he comes to meet Abraham, or Abram at the time, after, defeating, after Abraham had defeated this confederation of kings who had taken his nephew Lot captive. Abraham goes and he defeats his kings, he, these kings, he rescues his nephew. And as he's traveling back, it tells us that he went through this valley called Shave, or the valley, or the king's valley. And this is what Genesis tells us in Genesis chapter 14. It says, And after his return from the defeat of Chertelemear and the kings who met him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shave, that, that is the king of Va a valley, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And it says in parentheses, he was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Okay. 
So back in the Genesis account, we're introduced to this man, Melchizedek. It says he was a king of Salem. He was a priest of the Most High God. Um, his name actually means, Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. And he ruled over the city of Salem, which is actually ancient Jerusalem. And what, what Salem means is the Hebrew word shalom. It means, it means peace. It means harmonious peace. And if you notice in this Genesis account that we just read, Melchizedek spoke of God as both creator and deliverer. He, he actually brings bread and wine to Abraham after his victory over his enemies. And think about what we were talking about before, about biblical typologies, right? Here you have this high priest. His name means king of righteousness, right? He, he, he's, the, he's the king of peace. And what is he bringing to Abraham? Bread and wine. Again, this allusion to this foreshadowing of communion. So here you have this Old Testament king who appears out of nowhere. And what is he doing? He's preparing a table for Abraham. And in response to this, what does Abraham do? He actually, from the spoils of victory, he tithes a tenth or 10% of everything to Melchizedek. Now, listen, that's significant, right? And again, the writer of Hebrews, he's giving clarification as to who Melchizedek was in order to highlight truth about the priestly ministry of Jesus. You guys with me? I hope so. Okay. I told you this was going to be work, right? Rihanna, I think, saying work, 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 work. This is a better kind of work, all right? If it were not for what we learned about Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7, the entire chapter, we would not realize the deep significance of what we might consider to be really seemingly irrelevant details, like if you just had Genesis and you read this, you would sit there and say to yourself, what, why was this even written in Scripture? But in considering what his name means and, and the city that he ruled over, it's worth noting that righteousness was mentioned first and then peace. Because I think what, what the Scripture is communicating to us is there can be no peace apart from righteousness, right? And, and, and there is nowhere else where this is more beautifully seen than the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. We read in Psalm 85, verse 10, that mercy and truth met together, righteousness and peace kissed. And because Jesus met all the righteous requirements and demands of God against our sins, we know now we have peace with God. And it tells us that he didn't have a father. He didn't have a mother. He didn't have a genealogy. There's no record of his birth or his death. And because of the wording here, there is, this has led some people to believe and consider that Melchizedek might have been a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. We all know that Jesus did not come into existence in the manger because Jesus has always been, right? He's God. He's eternal, the second person of the Trinity. But there are appearances of Jesus, okay, in the Old Testament, which are called Christophanies or Theophanies. And because of the wording here in Hebrews chapter 7, some people believe that this may very well be an actual appearance of Jesus. In fact, in early Jewish writings, um, he was believed to have been an angel. By the time the first century Judaism came about, uh, the Jews thought him to be Shem, the oldest son of Noah. The, the early church fathers, though, saw him as human. Now, the key to understanding this mysterious figure is found in taking the statements that are made about him and understanding them in context. And the context is we're talking about this priesthood that Melchizedek was part of. And now Jesus is part of this order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing here, he's making a distinction between the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Aaron. Right? And in order to qualify for the Aaronic priesthood, a man had to be born in the tribe of Levi, Levi, and he had to be born or be part of the family of who? Of Aaron. That's the only way you could be a high priest. So genealogy was fundamentally important to be able to say, hey, listen, I have a right to be a high priest because look at my bloodline. Remember also... The qualification to be a high priest began at birth, but then it ended when that person died. I hope you guys are tracking with me, okay? Now, 
Melchizedek, again, this contrast being made, his, his priesthood was quite different. He did not inherit the priesthood by being born into a priestly family. God chose him and designated him as a priest. So the writer is saying, notice, not that this is the pre-incarnate Christ, which is what I hold to, that he isn't. But as far as his priesthood is concerned, there's no mention of his family or of his birth and death in typology to show us that his priesthood continues. In order to communicate to us that Jesus' high priestly ministry will continue forever. I told you this was work. I told you this was work. All right. And it also says he was not the son of God, but it says that he resembled the son of God. And, and, and this is how he resembled the son of God in this respect. His priesthood would continue without interruption. Unlike Aaron's priesthood, where if Richard Ortiz was the high priest, he would stop being that high priest once he died on a particular day. And as we continue through the book of Hebrews here, as specifically here in chapter 7, right? The writer is going to demonstrate that Melchizedek's priesthood in so many different ways is far superior than Aaron's. And in this particular chapter, he's going to give three arguments to prove his point. Now, I was only assigned the first 10 verses. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, so we're only going to look at the first argument. And, that, and the first argument is this, that the superiority of the Melchizedekian, which is, is a word actually, priesthood is seen in the fact that Abraham off, offered tithes to Melchizedek and then Melchizedek blessed Abraham. That's the first argument that he's making. And we'll see later on in the chapter that there's actually going to be a change taking place. The second argument is, is that there's a change that takes place in the priesthood because what Jesus' priesthood does is it supersedes or replaces Aaron's priesthood. And then the final argument is going to be the perpetuity of Melchizedek's priesthood, that it continues on forever. Okay? So if you have gotten to this point, the best is yet to come. Verses 4 through 6 tell us this. How great this man was to whom Abraham, notice, the patriarch. He's saying, those of you who are reading this epistle know that Abraham is the patriarch. All of Israel traced their lineage to him. Okay? How great this man was to Abraham that he gave him a tenth of his spoils. Verse 5, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take the tithes from the people, that is, okay, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his descendants from them received tithes from Abraham, and he blessed him who had the promises. So, Abraham, the patriarch. Abraham had these amazing promises given to him by God. Abraham, okay, through whom Levi came, that was his posterity. Notice this. Abraham being one of the greatest figures in Jewish history gives a tenth of his spoils to Melchizedek. The idea is that Abraham, when it says he gave him these spoils, is that he gave him the choice spoils. He didn't give him leftovers. He gave him the first fruits, as it were. Of what, of what he gained after this great military victory. And we know that according to the, the law, the Levitical priests, they were, they were given a commandment by God to actually request and collect tithes from their fellow Jews. We see that in Numbers chapter 18. And, and again, he's making this contrast and this distinction, highlighting the superiority of Melchizedek's priesthood. In verse 6, when, when he received tithes from Abraham, this was unusual. It, it was unconventional. Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, through whom the Messiah would be born and all the nations of the earth would be blessed, was paying tithes to someone who had no connection, who had no relation to the chosen people of Israel. Right? This, this must have been mind-boggling to the readers of the epistle of Hebrews. He was saying that Melchizedek's priesthood even superseded ethnic and racial barriers. And he says... And he blessed him who had the promises. I'm going to read to you that blessing again in Genesis chapter 14. It says this. That this is how Melchizedek blessed Abram. It says, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, 
And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands, right? Again, this is all leading to this principle that we're going to see in verse 7. But the commentator Adam Clark says this about this blessing. He says, the blessing here spoken is not the simple well-wishing of good upon someone else, which is done by inferiors to superiors, right? You, you ever had someone that you had no resources to help and you go, well, I wish you luck. Right? This is not what Melchizedek did. This is what the, the commentator says. He says, it is the action of a person authorized to declare God's intention to bestow good things on another. Melchizedek had authority to pronounce blessing and bestow good upon Abraham from the Lord God Most High. And then here's verse 7. It says, it is beyond dispute. Here's the principle that he's establishing. The inferior is blessed by the superior. Right? When, when one man blesses another, it's understood that the superior is blessing the inferior. Right? The, the, someone blesses me with something that I don't have on my own. The inferior is the one who blesses another who holds a superior position. Now, it's really important that we slow down a little bit for 30 seconds. Majority of us are Gentile believers. We have to consider what's being written here and try to picture the reaction to, the reaction of these Hebrew recipients to this epistle, right? It's kind of like for me saying that baseball is not America's pastime, right? Like that's like, I, I struggle with that, right? Because everything, I'm, I love baseball, my favorite sport. It reminds me of my grandfather. I think about all the great memories, especially being a Yankee fan, right? 27 championships. I mean, come on, baby. How could you not be? Anyway, Abraham, one of the most revered men in their history. He was a national hero, but they were learning that although he was a great man of faith, this non-Jewish priest was superior to him because Abraham tithed to him and he was blessed by him. Think about this. This was in their Bible the entire time and they never noticed it or didn't really fully understand it. And I wonder how much truth is in our Bibles that we kind of just gloss over we don't fully understand it because we're not willing to do the, the hard work. I, I, I've, I've been challenged myself to change the way I think about church because so many times I think we come to church with this attitude. What am I getting out of it? And when we feel that we didn't get something out of it, we grow discouraged and we have a propensity not to come back. First of all, we come to church to glorify and worship the Lord God of heaven and earth, our Redeemer Jesus. And we get something out of it when we worship him and we have a heart to minister to one another. We'll see that later on in Hebrews, that we are to consider one another and gather together, even though we see, even the more so as we see the day of the return of Jesus coming. So we would stir up love and good works in one another. And then in verse 8, he says, continuing this idea of tithes, he says, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. So when the priest of the Levites received tithes, they were mortal men because they lived and they died. But he's saying this in, in, in relationship to Melchizedek, right? But in the other case, by a, one of whom it is testified that he lives because it tell, we don't have a record of his death, okay? And again, it's not that Melchizedek was Jesus. For the typology and the example being, being made, there was no record of his family lineage or his birth or death in order to make this comparison with Jesus having an eternal priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood ties were received by men, to put it plainly, who would die eventually. Right? There was a constant succession of priests. Every one of them served within their own generation, and then they passed. They died. In the case of Melchizedek, there's no mention of his death. Therefore, he can, he can represent a priesthood which is unique in that it is forever. And again, this is why in the beginning, I mean, you might have said, why is Richard bringing up biblical typology? What does that matter? It matters so much as you read the scriptures to see that the scriptures are trying to communicate this unfolding of God's plan of redemption. Right? Jesus said the volume of the book is written of, of me. The Bible is a Christ-centered book. And then in verses 9 and 10, it says, One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, 
pay tithes through Abraham. So you might be saying to yourself, yo, is the right of Hebrews bugging out right here? Levi wasn't even born yet. How is he saying that he paid tithes to Melchizedek? He says, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So when Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, he was virtually receiving them from Levi. This is what he's trying to tell us. Levi was a descendant or an offspring of Abraham. And since Levi was the head of the priestly tribe, the writer of Hebrews is telling his readership and he's telling us, he's communicating that, in essence, the Aaronic priesthood paid tithes to the Melchizedekian priesthood and by doing this, acknowledged that he was superior. You guys with me? You ladies with me? Even though there's only two of you here, right? You guys with me? Although Levi wasn't born when Abraham did this, Abraham served as what? As a representative for all his posterity when he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. So the Levitical priesthood that came forth from Abraham was inferior to his priesthood. Turn with me. I told you we're going to jump around a bit to Psalm chapter 110. It's only seven verses. I'm going to read through it quickly. It's actually the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's important to look at in our context because it mentions Melchizedek. It helps us understand and appreciate Jesus' role as a king and priest. And this is what Psalm 110 says, a psalm of David. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand and he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment amongst the nations, filling them with corpses and he will shatter the chiefs over the wide earth. And he will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. Now, King David wrote this psalm for a future king, right? There may be an application that he wrote this for his son Solomon, prior to Solomon becoming king in 971 BC. But there's also a sense that there's something future and messianic about what he's talking about. He's writing about a descendant from his line who, of course, we know to be who? This is Jesus, our great priest and king. And the reason I can say that with confidence is because in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 22, it tells us this. It says, now the Pharisees were gathered together and Jesus asked them a question and said, hey, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Jesus is like, so what do you think about the Messiah? Wh whose son is he? And, and, and they said, well, we know that he's uh, the son of David. And he said, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? So if David was his father, why would David call him Lord? And look at what Jesus quotes from Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he son? What was, what was Jesus saying here? Jesus came through the lineage of David, but Jesus here is claiming deity in that David called him Lord. And listen to the response from these Pharisees. And it said, and no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Like this is the ultimate shutdown. Jesus shut him down. He, you know, they were trying to break, they were trying to drop knowledge on him. And Jesus said, here, take this. Boom. Notice that. See, and as we read through the psalm, we see what? The psalm begins with this declaration that this future king will, be a, will have a greater honor, power, and authority more than any human king before him. It says he sits, in verse 1, at the right hand of the Lord God. Think about that. This king is sitting at the right hand of the Lord God, the highest place of honor. And he derives, verses 2 and 3, his authority from the Lord God. He, he exercises Yahweh's own royal rule. And this results in the subjection of the king's enemies, as well as the protection for the king's realm and his people. But this messianic figure is not only a king, but he's also a priest, verse 4, according to the order of Melchizedek. And in a sense, this was nothing new because the Davidic kings untook, undertook some priestly functions that were not the things that were commanded directly for the Levites. We see them leading worship, guiding in corporate prayer, offering sacrifices on special occasions that did not infringe upon the sacrifices that were supposed to be ordered up by the priesthood. 
But what is this showing us and developing? Is developing the priestly functions of the Davidic dynasty and connecting it with these early Jebusite king priests who once ruled over Jerusalem. And you may say, Rich, I have no idea what that means. But here's the important thing. This means that David's lineage could claim divine support, okay? Divine support for their rule over the promised land. And what that was, it was a fulfillment of Abraham's blessing that he received, specifically in our context, from Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And then you see verses 5 through 7, it says, the Lord God is standing by the king. We see God as this divine warrior who helps defeat his enemies on an individual, on a co co corporate, and even a cosmic level. The, these enemy kings are not only actual kings that existed, but they represent in this messianic psalm future cosmic, right? it represents the cosmic powers of chaos that God ultimately overthrows through this king who came according to the order of Melchizedek on behalf of Israel and all the nations. What, what I'm saying is this, is that God's salvation extends beyond my individual soul and your individual soul to our physical bodies, to corporate systems, and even cosmic powers. I think sometimes when we think of salvation, we only think about how it affects us. And salvation is a lot more comprehensive than that. Our, our bodies themselves, this mortal is going to put on immortal. This, 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 this temple will put on eternal. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The, the, the redemption is so much more comprehensive than we fully understand or beg to even try to understand. And, and the psalm ends in verse 7 with this beautiful picture with the Lord God, with Yahweh, refreshing himself from a brook. And what is that portraying to us? It portrays him as one who sympathizes with the human condition. And, and this should stir our hearts. We, we might not, listen, I'm still wrestling through with some of this stuff, but this is what it should do. It should stir our hearts and help us understand that we are right now anticipating a better king. Melchizedek, this king of righteousness, ruler over Salem, was a foreshadowing and a type of Jesus who is the true king of righteousness, who lived the perfect life that none of us could live. And he's also the true king of peace who came to earth to bring peace through his sacrificial death and resurrection. We'll see later on in verse 7 that he's a priest forever, again reiterated according to the order of Melchizedek in verse 17. We see that it's not through the vertical lineage, right, but through the order of Melchizedek. We see that this makes his priesthood superior. Look at what verse 11 tells us here in our text. It says here, now, if perfection had been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise, according to the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron, right? If the people were given the law and they died according to the law, shouldn't that show us that there was something greater awaiting them? Is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. It tells us in chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. Why do we celebrate communion? We celebrate the ratification of a new covenant ratified by Jesus' blood. Not by law, but by grace through faith. And because of this, he holds a priesthood permanently, chapter 7, verse 24, that continues forever. And because of this, we read it in the beginning, verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Listen, as believers, we can rest knowing that Jesus is the perfect king who rules with infinite power and with justice. We should be comforted in knowing, but he is also the perfect high priest who ministers with infinite mercy and he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. Saints, because of our union with Jesus, we're reminded of our Melchizedek-like call to expand God's kingdom as well through truth and justice. As members of God's royal family, we're called in Scripture a royal priesthood. We are to be channels of mercy and healing within our community of believers, within our local communities, and, and, and for the rest of this world. I think... One of the most thrilling truths about this promise is that God will set that Davidic king as a ruler over us all one day. Jesus was this king, 
And he even partially fulfilled this through his people. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. And listen, as we wrap this up, I just want to close with a couple of thoughts. Are you, are you facing difficult circumstances? Every one of us in one way or another is facing that. Do you feel as if your enemies have defeated you? I want to encourage you in this way. Do not fear, for God is working to bring all things under Jesus' feet, and his kingdom will one day be plain to all. Remember when Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray? One of the things that Jesus taught, one of the principles Jesus taught of prayer was that a healthy prayer life is going to also incorporate this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and I wonder, do we have a passion for and are we pursuing God's glory, his will and the furtherance of his kingdom? Or are we so preoccupied with ourselves that we care more about our reputation, what brings us glory, our will and our own little kingdoms. I think as we dive into the scriptures and we see the majesty of Jesus, it changes our hearts and our preoccupation becomes him, not ourselves. See, the presence of God's kingdom in this age refers to the reign of Jesus first in our hearts and in in our lives as believers. It references the reigning presence of Jesus within his body, the church. So that as we increase in love, as we walk in obedience, as we honor him, as we serve and proclaim the good news, his kingdom is visible to people who aren't a part of it. And he says, not only that God's kingdom, but that God's will would be done. This means God's revealed will, which involves us living in a way that's pleasing to him as revealed in Scripture. And just as God's will is perfectly experienced in heaven, Jesus prays that it will be experienced on earth. The very will of God will be expressed in its fullness only when God's kingdom comes in its final form, when Jesus returns in power and great glory. But listen, it should be increasingly seen in this age as well, when we as his people are preoccupied with his kingdom and we pray, Heavenly Father, not my will, but your will be done. Let your, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, saints, are we living as kingdom-minded people? Is Jesus ruling and reigning over our hearts? Man, I know this chapter was difficult, but, but you know what? Good things come when you work out hard, right? When you work through difficulties, good things come. And my prayer is as we continue to venture through chapter 7 in particular, that as we elevate Jesus to his proper place, we grow in our understanding as to what it means that he's a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that brings us to a place of worship. That the same way that Melchizedek came unto Abraham, Abraham offered tithes and he was blessed. When we come to Jesus, we offer ourselves to him as living sacrifices, as those who are subjects in his kingdom. And that our honest and sincere prayer will be, your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You think about so many of the difficulties we face as believers because we want our will and our kingdom first. But as we grow in our understanding of who Jesus is, as we see him in all his majesty and all his glory, as we see him as the one who will one day come and rule and reign, may we live as if that's already happened. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for even the most difficult portions of Scripture. Lord, we thank you that we have to think about these things, that we have to wrestle through them. Even Paul told Timothy that the hardworking farmer should be the first to partake of the crops when he talked about the Scriptures. He said that we should be a workman or a workwoman, Lord, who, who, who works hard and diligent and, and plowing the, the, the soil of the word. So that way we need not be ashamed, but we could rightly divide the word of truth. Peter tells us that we should sanctify you in our hearts. And that we should be able to give a reason for the hope that's within us with meekness and reverence. Lord, in this Advent season, this is not an Advent message, but in the season of Advent that we're in, may our hearts and minds be redirected to the King of glory who took upon flesh. 
if Abraham understood how superior Melchizedek was and that he who was the patriarch, him who had the promises, the, the very posterity of the Levites themselves, if he gave tithes to Melchizedek, Lord, how can we not give you our very lives? And Lord, we thank you that you're praying for us. Where would we be if you were not currently and actively praying for us? Did you not exhort Peter when you knew Peter would deny you? And you looked at Peter and said, Peter, listen, you're going to deny me. But understand this. I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Lord, because you who began a good work, it's your work in us. You are faithful to complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, may our hearts be stirred for the deeper things of God. And when I mean the deeper things of God, I don't mean heady, knowledgeable things, Lord, but knowledge in the sense of knowing you more, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.